In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, instruct the hearts of your faithful by light of the Holy Spirit. Grant that by the same Spirit may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lady Fatima, St. Joseph, St. Ignatius, St. John Bosco, St. John Vianney, St. Alphonse Liguori, O God's angels and saints, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Good afternoon. There is a um, anecdote very uh, well known in the Broom family. That means my clan. There's nine children. My parents have 39 grandchildren, so a pretty big, pretty big family, no? Uh, this uh, Monday celebrate the second anniversary of the death of my father, and if you're in town, we're going to be celebrating a mass for my father at seven o'clock. So I try to pray as much for my father as as I possibly can. <clears throat> uh, my father uh, uh, wasn't a saint, uh, but he had a lot of good qualities. So I like to tell. Um, one or two anecdotes, and then we'll move into our topic. <clears throat> My father worked on Wall Street for, for quite a few years. And we lived in New Jersey, so we'd have to travel from Hoboken, New Jersey, to downtown. And he, um, because uh, crossing over the George Washington Bridge, there's, there's a lot of traffic here, but New York is even worse, if you've ever been there. So uh, one occasion, was about eight o'clock in the morning, he was um, he arrived at New York, and he was waiting for a subway. And uh, about eight o'clock, and there was just tons of people there. And some man pushed my father. Now, if you're in New York, if someone pushes you right away, you check your pocket to see if the wallet's there, because there's a lot of pickpocketers in New York. Not to say that you don't have them in L.A., no? But you have a lot of pickpocket. And it was, he didn't have his wallet, but he saw the guy. It almost knocked him down. So he, um, the guy entered into the subway. It wasn't my dad's, because you've, you've got connection A, B, C, D. And he tried to grab the guy and pull him out, because <laughs> the last thing you want to do is lose your wallet. But the guy wouldn't, the guy wouldn't correspond to my father. So the doors were closing, and my dad tried to pull the guy out, but he, he ripped, ripped half of his shirt off, but he, he couldn't get the guy out. So he had half of the shirt of my father, but he didn't have his wallet. Half of the shirt of this guy. So he finally got into his subway, <clears throat> and he was really worried because he didn't have his wallet. As soon as he got into his office, he decided that he would call my mom to tell her the bad news. So he calls... And my mom responds and said, who is it? This is your husband, Ed. And he says, you'll never guess what happened downtown today. And she said, I don't know, but you left your wallet on the dresser this morning. My brother is a graduate from Dartmouth in Columbia. He, in Dartmouth, he actually turned that into a play <laughs> as a comedy, you know. <laughs> Can you imagine the wife of that guy when he came home half of a shirt? What happened today? I met a crazy guy in the subway in New York. <laughs> so, 
I've said I have, a degree, I have a degree in English, philosophy, theology, and jokeology. It's a good, good degree, right, Daniel? <laughs> okay, let's follow up on our meditation on David. Okay, we've, uh, we've arrived at the sin of David. And uh, just to refresh your, your memory, vanity, presumption, pride, self-reliance, not God-reliance. And then after that, having no, no plan, and going up to the palace room and stretching out on, on the king size bed of the king. Okay? Laziness and wandering aimlessly. Then not watching over his eyes. L the lust, adultery of the mind. Adultery of the emotions, adultery of the heart, physical adultery. That's what we learned. That's what we meditate upon. The last point was this, is that after David did this, he gave a big sigh of relief because he felt that his problem was resolved. He entered into what we call a state of denial. In other words, he tried to take this and just sweep it underneath the rug, as if nothing had happened. Hint, hint, cover-ups today. So I'm not painting the situation, the ecclesial situation, but if you if you uh, pray over this, you're going to see I purposely chose David so you can pray over what has happened in the church over the past 50, 60 years and what could happen in the future if we do not own up to who we are and we do not use prudence and vigilance as to watching over our, 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 our thought life, what we see with our eyes, what we desire in our hearts and what our desires turn into. Our desires turn into actions, be it good actions or bad actions. So what has happened over the past 70 years, uh, the consequences are being revealed now, but we're not, out of the, we're not out of the dark tunnel yet. We might be halfway into it. No? And I'm, not a, I'm not cynical or skeptical, it's just as reality. I'll say this now, and then we'll keep. We'll follow the itinerary of David. All of you, if you really want to become priests, you all have to become great saints. Do you hear that? And I don't say that as a pious platitude or a nice sounding cliche, but really, we're called to become saints. The worst of times can be the best of times if we're walking with the Lord. And eventually you're going to be studying church history. Church has always gone through tough times. Fulton Sheen says really tough times every 500 years. Yep. Christological heresies, and then you got the separation from, Ro from Rome, the Greek Orthodox Church, and then 1500 you got the Protestant Reformation. Now it's another 500 years. Sheen was a real prophet, a real prophet. So we're in another one of those 500 years cataclysms where there's a real tumult, tempest within the church. Some of you had done the exercise with us in the time of Ignatius. Those were tough times. And I really love, I really love studying the 16th century because you got, you got Luther, you got You've got um, Henry VIII, you've got Calvin, you've got Melanchthon, you've got Zwingli. 
these are the big the big guns of the Protestant Reformation. But then you also have you got Teresa of Avila. You got John of the Cross. You got Ignatius. You got you got John of Avila. You got one of the greatest bishops in the Catholic Church, Charles Borromeo. You got Philip Neri. You got Pius V. You got Juan Diego and the Lady Guadalupe too, 1531, right? So those are those were tough times. But God was able to raise up great saints. You have to be the Latter day Saints. <laughs> not not Mormons though. Okay. <laughs> If you ever read St. Louis de Montfort, he says the Latter-day Saints will be those who have the rosary in one hand, the cross in the other hand, and Jesus and Mary inscribed in their hearts. St. Louis de Montfort. He wasn't prophesying the advent of the, of the Mormon church by Joseph Smith, was he? No. So that was a, a side note, but of, of great importance. All of us try to pursue holiness of life. Let's go back to David. So David, it's done. Uh, so what he does is uh, David, David does this. Um, he's, uh, he's committed the act of adultery. Okay, that's it. No one's going to know. And then what happens is Bathsheba sends him a note. It says, I am with child. Oh, boy. <laughs> now, David is a cover-up artist. But it's going to come to light. What is the problem lately? Cover up, right? Covering up and not, re not revealing what's, what has happened. So I really feel you, if you meditate upon you can see a real close connection between what David did and what's happened in many places. The gospel yesterday was, was Jesus says everything is going to come to the light if you, if, you, if you went to Mass yesterday, right? Everything is going to be said in dogma is going, going to be revealed in the light. So God sees everything. So David, okay, he hears this, that Bathsheba is pregnant with his child. Now you're going to see how, how this holy man of God, and he was a holy man of God, how he's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. This is called the chain effect of sin, or the domino effect of sin. He's going to get worse and worse and worse. Now, sin does have consequences. Eventually, you're probably going to be reading <coughs> John Paul II's Apostolic Exhortation, Reconciliation and Penitentiae. I've taken a number out of that in my spiritual exercises program, which he talks about the five different effects of sin, the theological, the social, the personal, the ecclesial, and the cosmic. Remember that? These are the effects of sin. They're not done in a vacuum. Theological effect, our sin, our sin hurts God. Social, our sin hurts others. Personal, our sin hurts us. John Paul II says that sin is moral suicide. Ecclesial, you know what that means, the church. By sinning, we're hurting the church, which is mater and magistra, both mother and teacher, and cosmic. The church, the sin even hurts the world in which we live. So David, he's starting to sweat. He's getting hot under his collar. <laughs> he's getting tough. Yeah, this is this is this is kind of this is going to get tough. What happens if the husband of this gal recognizes that um, that she's pregnant by someone? So David hatches an idea. I got it. He found out the husband of this woman. His name was Urias, the Hittite. He was the shield bearer of Joab the general. 
So he walks side by side with Joab, trying to prevent the arrows and the shots to kill Joab the general. So he thought, well, I know what I'll do. I'll wine him and dine him, then he'll go, back, go down to the house of his wife, have relations, and then that'll be it. Back then, I don't think they had any DNA tests, did they? They didn't have any DNA tests back then. I don't think so, no? So that was his intention. To wind the guy, to dine the guy, and then he's going to be a um, little bit inebriated. He'll go down and have relations with his wife. And when the baby's born, you're not going to know where it comes from. That was his intention. And what's very interesting, Urias, he's, he's, a, you know, he's a good pagan. He's not a... He's not even, he's not a believer in the God of Yahweh. But what nobility of character, this man. In contrast to David. So David summons him. He arrives at the door of David. And David sits down and starts to talk to him. How are things going in the battle with General Job? He says, great, things are really going well. So David says, okay, now go down and... Spend the night with your wife. And he says, Your Majesty, you know, when we're at war, we practice abstinence from, from women. We don't, we don't do that. That's part of the war discipline. It was a, a vow of celibacy for a month anyway. Huh? So David, he's getting nervous. All these plans he's trying to concoct are blown up in his face. An idea. He brings him to his table and he feeds him a sumptuous meal and he gets him drunk. Now, what was David's reasoning now? Well, if he's drunk, he's not going to be sleeping in my palace. You know, his house is just down... Down the way there, he's going to go back and wander into the home with his wife and have marital relations. Obviously. Guess what happens? <laughs> he sleeps outside the door of David. So he's conscious enough to recognize, even though I am a little bit inebriated, I'm not going to break my, my vow as a soldier in the army of David. What nobility of character. What integrity, huh? So David, he's really sweating now. He's really getting nervous. See, see what he's doing? He's getting worse and worse and worse. Now David, what he does is he writes out a letter to General Joab. The letter, in the letters contain this message. Put Urias in the front line of the battle. where the battle is most fierce. Then, pull back the troops so that your rise will be mowed down. Talking about, talk about getting worse and worse. And how ironic that letter that he wrote, that he wrote is delivered by Joab by guess who? Urias is delivering his death sentence to Joab. I think maybe he would have think of opening it up and just checking out what it is. I mean, he could have done that. But this man is so honest, so valiant, so noble, such integrity of person, that he brings the message to Joab. Now see how, how Davidson is involving other people. He's, he's asking the chief general of the army to be complicit in murder. Aren't some of these things that are happening in church, there's complices in this? It's not kind of like a domino effect where you have many people kind of a nest of, of cover-ups and indecency and wrongdoing. You really see there's a real connection between happened 3,000 years ago What's happening today? 
Now, Joab, Joab could have said, oh, Your Highness, um, there's no reason why this should be done to your eyes. He's a good soldier. But Joab, giving into the prudence of the flesh, as Aquinas says, giving into a desire to be liked by the, by the king, he consents to it. Then there's the battle, which is fierce on one, one part of the battlefield. And Joab puts Uriah in the front of the field. And then Joab tells the other soldier to pull back. And Uriah says, mowed down and he's killed. So David has committed first degree murder. See the domino effect of this? Here's another modern connection. Does it sometimes happen when people today commit fornication and adultery? Sometimes it, it leads to murder? Adultery, fornication, unwanted pregnancy, abortion. There's a real connection. There's a real connection. Now, David, the news that brought to him that Urias is dead, now he can rest in peace. Uh uh. The chapter that follows this dastardly deed of David is another chapter I think that can speak a lot to us. How easy it is for us in the formation of our conscience. How easy it is for us to you know, study moral theology later on, the whole idea of conscience. We can suppress our conscience. We can put our conscience to sleep. We can cauterize our conscience. That's a medical term. We become seared. We can even kill our conscience. Maybe in some of these things that are happening now, people involved were actually put in their conscience, suppressing their conscience. Maybe even killing their conscience. So David, he believes mission completed. Now how good God is that God decides he's not going to leave David in this situation, but he sends to David one of the prophets, one of the famous prophets in the time of David, and his name is Nathan. So Nathan knocks on the door, and David come in, and Nathan sits down, and he starts to talk to David by means of a parable. And the parable was this. There was a, a rich man who had a lot, and then there was a poor man that just had a little, little lamb that was like a daughter to him. And the rich man had a guest, and he wanted the little lamb of the poor man, which meant everything to the poor man. The poor man did not relinquish the little lamb. So the Rich man took the lamb, killed it, and offered it as a meal for his guest. David hears this, and he is incensed. He explodes. He says, that man deserves death. And Nathan says, that man is you. You took the innocent lamb, and you slaughtered that lamb. Now your sins are going to be made public. All is going to be brought to light. 
finally, David admits his guilt. And look what's being brought to light after many years in the church. So many hidden sins, the cover-up sins that have been present within the church, right? Aren't they being brought to light in a very painful way today? Finally, David, leaving the denial that, that, was, that was characteristic of this whole scenario, finally admits that he has sinned. And as a result of this, we give this as part of your meditation this evening, this afternoon. We have possibly the best act of contrition that was ever written in the history of the world. It's called the Miserere. You find in your Bible Psalm 51. This is a response, David's response to Nathan, and it's his act of contrition. Which we say in the liturgy of the hours every Friday, in the liturgy of the hours, the evening prayer. And it is, O oh God, against you have I sinned. Not Bathsheba. I have sinned. My sin is always before my eyes. Purify me, and I will be white as the snow. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the, heart, face of the earth. A broken and humble heart, O Lord, you will not spurn. There's a summary of Psalm 51 in a few words. David finally admits that he has sinned. And Nathan says, God has forgiven you. God is slow to anger but rich in mercy. God has forgiven you. However, because of your sin, because you're a sin, there's going to be consequences. There, here's another mini topic in your meditation upon what's going on in the church. We do not live in a vacuum. As the poet says, no one is an island unto himself. We don't live in a vacuum. So what I'd like to do now the latter part of this talk is to show you the different consequences of the sin of David. Then now let's ask ourselves, how can we live out our vocation that God is calling us to? How can we live it out? Number one, the child that was conceived in Bathsheba is born. But the child born becomes very, very sick. David spends days praying and fasting and imploring God to save the life of the child. child dies. So what does Paul say in Romans? He says that because of sin, death entered into the world. As the letter of the Romans, related to Genesis chapter 3, the sin of Adam and Eve. So right away, right away we see one, one of the effects of this sin is the death of an innocent child. How many innocent victims are suffering because of what's happened to church? Innocent victims. 
have been exploited, have been used as mere objects. That's part of a wrong sexuality is instead of seeing the person created in the image and likeness of God in his innate dignity and destiny, he's seen as an object to be utilized. Objectifying. Utilizing. Exploiting. And then discarding. Rejecting. Like a, like a Coca-Cola bottle. You just use it, just chuck it. Trash it. Using the person. We should never be using any person. We should be respecting their innate dignity, which comes from being a human person, created in the image and likeness of God. And the person is baptized, even more so. This person is a son or daughter of God, a temple of the Holy Spirit, with a destiny, that their destiny is heaven, principle and foundation. Let's take, okay, let's take three of the sons now of David. David has children. And what you see in the children are the, the sins of the children are very often a reflection of the, of the sin of the father or mother. Even in your lives, I mean, you guys, you guys, you, you've, got, you've got a lot of virtues. We all have our limitations, too. And if you look at yourself and you look at the, your family upbringing, you can see that you're imitate a lot of good things in mom and dad, but some of the bad things too, right? So David, he's going to be transmitting to the, the future generation his good qualities, but also what happened with Bathsheba. Amnon. Amnon raped, raped Dinah. In a certain sense, when I was putting together this talk, a very real sense, David abusing his power, you'd almost say that he kind of raped Bathsheba by abusing his power. How many people in authority have, have abused their power? raping individuals, defrocking them of their dignity, of their purpose, and ruining lives. We should never destroy. We should always be edifying, building up. Let's take the second. Second is uh, certain names of the sons of David that maybe you ever heard. His name was Absalom. Absalom was one of David's sons. Now look at, look, at, look at who Absalom was, what he did, and see how that reflects what David actually did in this scene. David was, uh, when Absalom was a young man, David was in power. Uh, he had many soldiers. He had conquered many enemies. He had won many battles. He had a lot of power. So Absalom, his son, wanted to take over the kingdom from his father. But before his father was dead, Now, if David died, um, one of his sons was going was to take over the kingship, and it could have been Absalom. But in any case, Absalom decides to do a mutiny. And by mutiny, I mean this. To go against his father, and he, and he raises up an army 
of rebels to go against David, his father. And the number of these rebels was growing and growing. And once David, once David hears this, you know, you know the biblical passage? Let's take the flight. Otherwise, Saul, uh, Absalom will visit disaster upon us. The words of David. So David takes off. And Absalom's army starts to fight the army of David. Then there's a key scene. David says, don't do anything to the young man. Something somewhat, I think, comical happens. Is that Absalom had long, he had a lot of hair. He wasn't a cholo. Okay? He had a lot, of, a lot of hair. Okay. He was on a donkey, traveling through the woods, and there was a terebinth tree from which the branches were hanging down. I always see this as somewhat comical. So there he is. He's moving a mile a minute on this donkey. <laughs> and as he arrives at the terebinth tree, what happens is the branches grab on to his hair and clings to his hair, and the mule goes running off. There he is hanging between heaven and earth. And someone brings the news to Joab, the general, with the order that David said, don't do anything to Absalom. What does Job say? Nonsense. He goes after Absalom with a spike and nails him once and twice and three times and kills Absalom. And they dig a big pit and they throw him in the pit and they throw these stones on top of Absalom. And as David finds out, someone comes to David and David asks, what, what has happened to Absalom? And the messenger says, I wish all of the enemies of David ended up in the same way that he ended up. Which was an evasive way of saying, he's dead king. So David breaks down and he starts to weep. One of the most moving scenes in the life of David. Absalom, Absalom, my son, Absalom, 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 my son. I wish I were to have died rather than you. Absalom, Absalom, my son, Absalom, Absalom, my son. And as the Bible says, their victory was turned into mourning because of the tears of David, who dearly loved his son. Do you see the connection there between what happened to what was placed in the heart of Absalom, the way Absalom ended his life? David killed an innocent man, right? David killed an innocent man. So you have a man, his son, who wants to kill David. You ever hear the phrase, what goes around comes around? Or maybe the, the boomerang effect, you ever throw, throw a boomerang? You know anything about it? About, you throw the boomerang well, it'll come right back to you. Maybe you, you, you know, do it in your recreation in the seminar, have a little bit of fun, okay? See if you can do it best, okay? Throw the boomerang, see if you can catch it. So there you have reflected in Absalom the sin of his father David. But there's one more. There's one more. In his latter years, David has another son. And his name of his son is Solomon which means, in Hebrew, man of peace. So Solomon grows up, and at the end of the life of Solomon, uh, of David, it seems as if the kingdom is going to be going to another. But Bathsheba insists, through Nathan the prophet, that the one who will be sitting on the throne of David will be Solomon. So David dies, 
he's buried, and Solomon takes over the kingship of David. Solomon was he a wise man. Solomon starts off as king. He's the wisest man in the world. He's the richest man in the world. Solomon is going to build the most majestic church in the whole world, which was the Temple of Jerusalem that eventually is going to be destroyed, you know, your Bible, in the year 68 by the Romans, as Jesus prophesied. But that huge, majestic temple was built by Solomon. It would have been like the St. Peter's of the world, okay? So Solomon, he, he, he was a religious man. He was an intelligent man. He was a man of the new order. He's a man that highly respected. He was a prayerful man. I think Solomon, it, 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 Solomon is fascinating. Do you remember the biblical passage? Solomon is uh, he's a young king, and he, um, he's talking to God. And God asks him, Ask me for whatever you want. In your prayer, what would, you, what would be your prayer? What would be your prayer even now if, if God were going to, you're sitting in front of Jesus, and Jesus says, what do you want? What would you say? I think it's a good I think it's a very very good question. I'll tell you what a great saint said then I'll tell you what Solomon said. Then we'll talk about what happened to Solomon. The end of his life Thomas Aquinas the greatest theologian in the world. All of you have read probably the Summa Theologica already two or three times, right? Mm -hmm. You have it probably written in Latin and written in English and Spanish. You all have it memorized, no? You're working on the Summa Contra Gentiles, mm -hmm. and then the Catena Aurea, his commentary on the Gospel of John, right? Okay, you're arriving at that little by little, right? <laughs> Some of his sermons, too. If anyone says, what is your favorite Mu who's, your, who's your favorite musician? Thomas Aquinas, Tantum Ergum, Corpus, right? <laughs> you know, someone told me that's my favorite, my favorite musician, Thomas Aquinas. The office of Corpus Christi. Beautiful hymns, right? Ave Verum Corpus, Tantum Ergum, O Salutatis Ostium, Sacro Convivium. Beautiful hymns in Latin. <laughs> But Thomas Aquinas, at the end of his life, Jesus appeared to him and said, Thomas, you've written well. What would you like? It wasn't power or pleasure or long life. He lived to be 49, pretty young. Or prestige. Or to be a bishop, he always turned it down. You know what he asked for? He asked for this. Give me the grace to love you more and more each day. You like that? Give me the grace to love you more and more each day. That was what Thomas Aquinas asked for. Was that wisdom? At the max, right? What about Solomon? Solomon asked for a wise and discerning heart. Wouldn't that be a good gift that seminarians should be asking for? Hello? A wise and discerning heart. 
a wise and discerning heart, very nation discerning, the rules for discernment, huh? To discern well, to, to accept the good and reject the evil, the rules, huh? So he was, the, he, he, was the, he was the wisest man in the world. The, the Queen of Sheba from, came from hundreds of miles away to sit at the feet of King Solomon to drink in his wisdom. In just one little story, there are two women that were fighting over a baby. Remember that story? And Solomon thought, one of them is lying. So Solomon said, okay, what we'll do is this, we'll cut the baby in half and half and half. And the mother said, no, give it to her. Okay, no, that's the mother. Pretty wise, huh? One of the many manifestations of the wisdom of Solomon. So Solomon was the wisest man in the world. up to a certain point and Solomon ends up as the biggest fool in the world. How could that happen? You know, we all have a kryptonite. We all have a fatal flaw, as you say in Greek literature. We all have our own Achilles heel. We all have our weak point. And many of these scandals came because, because of the fall of Solomon. It wasn't avarice. It wasn't envy. It wasn't anger. It wasn't gluttony. It wasn't pride. It was a capital sin of lust. That was the downfall of Solomon. The Bible says he gave his body over to foreign women. Lust, which the Bible says is also idolatry. What is idolatry? It's when you place any person, place, or thing above God, right? Lust can be a form of idolatry. So Solomon ends up his life, the wisest man in the world, who ends up as a fool. You can have some of the priests that are the wisest men in the world, they end up as fools. We don't practice vigilance over ourselves. We don't watch over ourselves day and night. Listen to this story. Related to Solomon. Related to us. One of the most famous painters in the world, his name is Leonardo da Vinci. He painted the Ultima Cena, the Last Supper. But how he did it was very original. He decided very spontaneously at random to choose individuals down the street of Rome if they could just pose as one of the, one of the, one of the apostles. One of, so, so he went up, he started, he started to look for, for uh, 13 individuals, the 12 apostles and Jesus, and he and he bumps into a very young, strong, attractive man. And eventually said, this can be Jesus. So he paints Jesus. Then he finds another man, Peter. Another man, Andrew. Another man, John. Another man, Philip. Then James the Less. Then Nathaniel, if you like Bartholomew. Thomas, who was the doubter. Simon the Zealot. And then he found 
Jude, uh, Jude, Jude Thaddeus. But he couldn't seem to find a dastardly figure of the man that we call Judas Iscariot. Couldn't find him. Wanted to find some of shady, kind of ugly, underhanded, um, suspicious, wily, cunning individual, shifty eyes. That <laughs> so would fit, fit the role of Judas. Finally, after a long time, he's walking through the streets and he saw a man laying in the gutter. Long beard, shifty eyes, dirty pants, shirt was ripped, laying in his own vomit, flies descending upon him. What a spectacle. And Da Vinci said to himself, that's the guy. That guy would be the perfect portrait of Judas in my picture. So your jaw is close. And he says, sir, could you do me a favor? What would you like? I'm painting the Last Supper. I've got Jesus, 11 the apostles. But I don't have the 12th, and that's Judas Iscariot. Would you be willing to pose as Judas Iscariot? That moment, a tear started to trickle down the right cheek. Then another tear started to trickle down the left cheek. Da Vinci said, why the tears? And the man said, the tears because a couple years ago, you asked me to pose, and I was Jesus Christ. It's a true story. We're acting in the person of Christ today. But will we be Judas tomorrow? Only God knows. There go I, save the grace of God. It's a shocking story, huh? As Teresa of Avila says, the corruption of the best is the worst. Yeah. The corruption of the best should be the priests and the bishops, right? We're called to be the good shepherds of the flock that's entrusted to us. We read that in the Liturgy of the Hours, if you do the Liturgy of the Hours, with the commentary of St. Augustine on the pastors for two weeks, right? Every year. So, I like I like to give you three suggestions to you as well as for me. Because I could be a Judas, we could all be a Judas, and we have to be honest with ourselves. We're all very weak. There go I, save the grace of God. And it, what a little flower said, whatever, whatever anyone else has done, I could do it, and worse. Francis said at the end of his life, I could still be a father to a thousand children. St. Francis of Assisi. <laughs> We're all weak. You're listening? Okay, the first is this. If we want to be faithful to our vows, your diocesan priest, we call them vows. But for you, it's almost the same thing. Your promise of celibacy, it's the same thing, different name.
You have to pray. You have to pray that you will be faithful to this gift that God has given to you. Father Thomas Dubay, one of the most eloquent writers in the past 50 years, has written a very good book on celibacy. And it's called The Charism of Celibacy. You know what the word charism, you mean the charismatic. Charism, it actually means a gift. The charism of celibacy. If you guys are called to the priesthood, you have to discern, because you're, you're in the beginning stages, you have to discern, you know, do you have that, do you have the charism? And I don't want to be, you know, hurt anyone's feelings, but if, if you don't have the charism, then you're not called to be a priest. You hear me? You have, to, you have to discern it. That's, that's part of the priesthood is that God gives the, the man, gives him a gift. There are many, there are many men that, that should be priests. They have the charism, but they're rejected. No? The other side of the coin. They've got it, but they run away from the gift. St. Alphonsus says they can be saved, but it's going to be more difficult. You, you're going to be saved by following the vocation that God has given to me. Like, I'm called to be a priest, but I'm not called to be a diocesan priest. I'm not, I'm not saying we're better than diocesan priests, but I, I just believe I, I want to live in community with, 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 with other men. I believe in the charism of the oblates. So uh, that's, uh, that's my, my charism. I have a double vocation, priesthood and religious life. There's a double vocation. It's a double blessing, but it's a double responsibility, too. And I'm not trying to deplete the seminary so the old guys come to the oblates. I'm not saying that, okay? Mm-hmm. I don't want to get the bishop angry at me, okay? <laughs> well, the seminary director angry at me. No, you're called to be a diocesan priest. You have that gift. Say yes to it. But celibacy is a gift. But you have to recognize it, number two. You have to recognize it as a gift. Then you have to thank God for the gift. You hear me? Then you have to, you have to, uh, you have to cultivate the gift. It has to be cultivated. If you, you don't use it, you lose it, as the young people say. But it has to be cultivated. You talk this out with your spiritual director. It has to be cultivated by spiritual, ascetical, mystical means. It has to be cultivated. It's like lifting weights. Yesterday I was at LA Fitness. I was swimming. I was lifting weights. No, if you don't, <laughs> you don't lift weights, you get flab. The muscle turns into gordura, as he says in You become flabby, no? You gotta, these are spiritual exercise, you gotta exercise this charism too. Then it has to be, it has to be defended. Both defended and protected. I remember, uh, Daniel, when I was in Argentina, I did some retreats with the um, Cristo Rey. And I remember they, they would wear the habit. And they would say, El abido no hace el mal que vete lo defiende lo define. You understand Spanish? It's a good one. Some of you speak Spanish? Only one, okay. El abido... No hace el que pero lo, lo, lo defiende, lo define. Translation? The, the habit doesn't make the monk, but it defends him and it defines who he is. Perfecta Caritata says that we have to have some exterior sign. We're, we're, this is an eschatological sign. 
you know what I mean? Eschatological sign pointing to we don't just live here, we live there too. We're created and made to go to heaven. So you have, you, you, you have to defend it, so you have to use all the means to, listen, to avoid, to avoid the near occasion of sin. That we say before going to confession, right? To avoid the near occasion of sin. You know, play with fire, you're going to get burnt. Common sense, right? Don't play with fire. So that's the first point. You've got to recognize the gift and pray to be able to live it out using all these means that I mentioned. Second is this. We're going to be ending this retreat with the greatest prayer in the world. And the prayer is the Eucharist. Do all of you believe in the Eucharist and love the Eucharist? Hello? If you do not have a love for the Eucharist, pack up and go home. You have an identity crisis as a Catholic and as a seminarian. Source and summit, right? The very source and summit, the very heart of our life is the Eucharist. And the best way to maintain celibacy or chastity is fervent, passionate communions. If you receive the Eucharist with fervor, and frequency, and fire, and love, you got it. Because by receiving the Eucharist, you receive God. And if you like, by receiving the Eucharist, you have a spiritual heart transplant. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Right? See, see there, there, there you got the sacred heart that looks like Jesus but it's a painting. But the Eucharist is lifted up. It doesn't look like Jesus, but it is Jesus. It just looks like a piece of bread. But once it's consecrated, it is the, it is the real presence of Christ. It's called transubstantiation. It is truly the body, the blood, the soul, the divinity of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's not a symbol, it's reality. You receive the, the Eucharist what you have is, because of concupiscence, we have lust. Aquinas calls it foamy peccati, the foams of sin. You see the Eucharist, you have the precious blood of Christ is flowing through our bloodstream. That's not metaphorical, that's real. That's why John Bosco, who I've mentioned many times, there he is, he would try to get the boys in the oratory to go to communion as often as possible when communion back then was twice a year. This was before Pius X, okay? Because you recognize these boys have got so strong passions, puberty is kicking in, they're not going to be able to count those passions. They don't have the blood of Christ. This is John Bosco. He was a pioneer of frequent communion. And this was 50 years before Pius X. John Bosco, is, he's living in the mid-19th century. Pius X is living in the beginning of the 20th century. Okay? Do you follow me? Love the Eucharist. And if you, right now, make very tepid, lukewarm communions, be converted in this retreat. Be converted. Mary has a daughter that's a nun in the... Uh, the, the, the Alhambra sisters. She has a nun with perpetual vows. Uh, a couple of you made the retreat with me. Okay, hopefully you'll all be able to make it next summer, we hope. In the sacristy, there's a plaque that says, Priest, man of God, say this Mass as if it were your first Mass, your last Mass, and your only Mass. I like that. You should receive communion as if it's your first communion, your last, and your only. Amen? Amen. Now, if you're doing this, 
this vow or celibacy that has been broken by so many, it's not that hard to live. St. Augustine, said at Villanova four years, St. Augustine, the Augustinians. St. Augustine says this, the human heart is called to love. And Augustine says, discern wisely what is the object of your love and then love with all your heart, Augustine. I love that. Pure Augustine. O Lord, you have made our hearts for thee. Our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. So that's what it says. The human heart is made to love. Choose wisely the object of your love, then love with all your heart. Who is the object of your love? It's not an object, it's a person. That's Jesus Christ. That's why he spoke about friendship with Christ. And last, but not least, if you really want to love, you really want to live out your vows, your promises, and if he holy and faithful priests that are going to be saving many, many souls. There's a saying I was brought up and raised with. Behind every successful man, there is a woman. Maybe this is one of the proverbs from my day and age. No, but that, that's a pretty well known. Behind every successful man, there's a woman. For us, that woman is the Blessed Virgin Mary. Amen? Do you believe it? If we really want to be faithful, we got to pray. We got to love the Eucharist. Let the Eucharist love us. Then we have to love Mary. If we do that, then we'll be faithful servants. You'll be faithful to the end. The end of your life, Jesus, the Son of Mary, will say, Well done, faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Father. Those, I hope, will be the last words those will be the last words in your life, and those will be the words that Jesus will receive you into heaven. So I think it, these, are, these are great times, very challenging times. But God will give all of you the grace, if you're given the vocation, to not only save your souls, but to save many other souls. The harvest is rich, but the labors are few. So let's beg the Blessed Mother, who is the mother of the Good Shepherd, to help us to become good shepherds in the flock of Jesus, the good shepherd of our soul. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among them, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now at the hour of death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, good. So you'll you'll go through the schedule, and then.